Michelle Sterling from the Friends of Science on. Hi, Michelle. It's good to have you back. I think you were one of my last guests when I kind of wrapped up the, the daily show I had on the go, and, and I'm glad we've got the chance to get you back on. So uh, welcome back. Thanks so much, and Happy New Year to everyone. And to you. Uh, so yeah, you know, you're, well, as I, when I reached out, I mean, something that's big in the news, something a lot of discussions going on about is the just transition. Uh, you guys addressed that at length back in April, uh, trying to, you know, lay out what it's about and everything, but perhaps if we could start there, cause people are now, of course, all arguing about what it may mean or what it's about. I mean, what is the just transition? Well, it's hard to know. Like it's a bit of a, a foggy day, if you like, when you look at the just transition, because there's a nine page report on the government website that talks about the just transition and how they want to be good to workers who are in industries that will be phased out, presumably oil, gas and coal. Um, but what are they going to transition to? I mean, there's just no transition, if you like. So um, all the things like wind, solar, um, any novel form of energy like hydrogen, it all requires oil, gas and coal to make the devices to power the units that install them, that maintain them, that back them up. So, you know, what are they really talking about in a just transition? Because what are you going to transition to? You're going to transition to electricity? Well, electricity is a secondary form of energy. It's generated by something, usually natural gas, hydro, or coal, or nuclear, or maybe biomass. But, you know, I have some statistics here from Natural Resources Canada, just to kind of put this in perspective for people. Of Canada's primary energy consumption in 2019, crude oil, natural gas, and natural gas liquids accounted for 71% of the total, uranium 16%, coal 5%, hydro 5%, and other renewables like biomass and wind and solar combined, 3%. So we're not going to transition to wind and solar overnight uh, or at all, because we're going to need oil, <laughs> a gas and coal to make all those things. And excluding uranium, fossil fuels accounted for 76% of Canada's total primary energy supply in 2019. And biofuels waste 4% and wind and solar 1%. So they're deluding you, they're deceiving you, they're misleading the public because there's no way that you can actually do this kind of transition, it's impossible. And it's also technically and economically impossible. We've got a report by Ken Gregory, our research director, and he did an analysis of decarbonization in the United States. It would cost trillions of dollars, 13 times the GDP of the US to decarbonize the US. And we did an assessment of RBC's um, $2 trillion plan. And it's way, way, way underestimated. So, you know, we have professional engineers who know how things work rather than ENGOs that are modeling on a computer and going, look, we can make Canada run on hydro from Quebec. Ha <laughs> ha, you know, you can't. Quebec is already out of hydro with their present uh, EV and electric heating policies in, in uh, Quebec. Uh, Parker Gallant wrote an article about how throughout the coldest days of winter, it's natural gas in Ontario that's propping up Quebec. So, um, you know, this is some kind of bizarre delusion by the federal government to think that they're going to transition to anything. That's my rant. <laughs> No problem. That's the ranting is what this show's about. And it's a good one. And, and part of, I think what gets a, a lot of people uh, nervous though, is okay, this government just doesn't seem to be working within common sense. Uh, but most of the economic indicators, world demand indicate that there's going to be very strong demand for our oil and gas for decades to come. We have a labor shortage in the oil and gas sector right now. Why would we even be thinking about transitioning people out of it? We should be training people to get them into it. We should be maximizing our production for this world need. But that's what makes us fear that the government's going to push them out and create the need to transition them. And, and that's, that's nerve wracking. Right. Well, I suspect that some of this bad advice has come from McKinsey and company. Um, I think everyone should read this book. 
and it will explain a lot of things that have happened in Canada because they've been a big advisor to the federal government. And we did a report called Grounded in Reality a couple of years ago that was countering uh, smart prosperity. And at the time, McKinsey had, had come up with this notion that over the next decade, $60,000 jobs would be created every year in clean tech. Well, that never happened because that market doesn't exist. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a non-starter. Um, you know, uh, in the Just Transition Plan that, that I mentioned earlier, the government has uh, $15 billion for investments, $15 billion for public transit, $17.6 billion for green recovery, whatever that is. Um, you know, these are billions of dollars that are just obviously flowing to the pockets of green grifters, green crony capitalists. And you have to realize, as you just said, the global energy demand is only going to grow. Western nations, this is North America and Europe, <clears throat> we're only 15% of the world's population. We have a report by Robert Lyman called When Giants Arise. And when you realize, you know, all these developing nations like China, India, Brazil, um, Nigeria, and other places in Africa, these, these countries demand huge amounts of energy. They want the same kind of status and living circumstances that we have. And they don't care about the Paris Accord. They see it as a way of, you know, really I think our competitor nations see the Paris Accord as the perfect way to launch a green trade war against us by claiming that if we Canadians shut down our oil and gas, we will be saving the planet. In the meantime, they don't care. They'll just do whatever is best for their people. So. You know, it's ironic to think that places that we might call dictatorships actually have governments that care more about their people than our government does. Well, yeah, I mean, it's hypocritical and it's, it's heartless. I'm going to rant about McKinsey a little bit after this segment as well. I have them on deck because it's been coming to light. Just there's some pretty questionable dollars have been going towards that organization from our pocket. And as you said, and then the outcomes you get are that uh, torqued sort of ideological crap that they advise and saying with these green jobs. Another area they talk about is, is these tech. And they just say tech is some broad, overwhelming thing. We'll just get everybody into tech. You'll all learn to code and you'll work making video games or something or for Amazon. But again, when we're looking, all of the tech sector are shedding jobs right now. Twitter laid off thousands. Amazon's laying off thousands. Uh, all of the heavyweights out there, uh, Shopify even, are, are cutting their staff dramatically. Why on earth would we be telling people, leave this booming industry that's paying you well, that has lots of world demand and will for decades, and jump into this sector that'll pay you half as much if you can find a job because they're laying everybody off right now. It's ludicrous. Right. And I mean, I think people have to put two and two together here on big tech, like <clears throat> McKinsey and the UNPRI have promoted high, uh, high tech as clean, as if it doesn't have a carbon, carbon footprint at all. And you hear Apple saying, oh, you know, we're 100% renewable. Google is 100% renewable. Well, guess what? These guys have just been buying renewable energy credits to make themselves look as if they're running on renewables. These are huge, huge energy consumers. So just imagine you've been telling the public and investors, you've been playing your ESG game now for decades. You've been pretending that you're clean tech and that you have no carbon footprint. And all of a sudden, energy prices in the world skyrocket and your operation is in the dumper because you're not making money anymore. It used to look like, hey, you know, we're providing this virtual uh, material to the world, so it has no carbon footprint. Well, in the back, it has a really big one, and now you have to pay double, triple, whatever for it, and the uh, renewable credits market isn't gonna do you any good, because those are real costs. Anyway, um, yeah, and again, it's McKinsey that worked with uh, Climate Works Foundation in the States to put together the Design to Win plan. And many of those people are the funders of the Tar Sands campaign against Alberta. So their objective was to push clean tech. They want to create, um, they actually want to create a sea change in the global economy, create two cap and trade systems worldwide. And um, ultimately, the goal is for every person to have a personal carbon ration. 
And uh, so, um, you know, how does that all relate back to the just transition? Well, I'm not too sure, but if you have a personal carbon ration, then I guess, you know, everyone can get climate money on your universal basic income. And, um, you know, these are all the factors that are playing into this just transition. And it might even be nationalizing the energy sector. That's what I think it probably will be. Well, yeah, that's my fear as well. I mean, we were going to, you know, we're being dealing with ideology rather than reality, unfortunately. And they seems mm -hmm. when their ideology can't come to pass, then they go into trying to force it to happen. Just like they've been telling us for decades that everybody's going to get into electric vehicles. Everybody's going to move on to electric vehicles. Well, here we are after decades and billions of dollars of subsidies and pushing and flogging, and still only 5% of the population at best is getting these electric vehicles. So what are they saying now? Well, we're going to illegalize the combustion engine by 2035, so you'd better get into those things. They don't care that we won't have the infrastructure. They don't care that it'll decimate the economy. They just think they've got to force this to happen somehow, putting a cart be before the horse, and it's going to cause catastrophic damage to our economy. Yes, it will. And uh, the big problems there, again, with this concept of transitioning, is that there's not enough power generation in Canada. We'd need 10,000 more megawatts, and it takes eight to, you know, it takes, a, so that would be eight Site C dam equivalents. And it takes about 20 to 30 years to build one of those dams. And there aren't very many dam locations left in Canada that would be suitable, not to mention all the environmentalists would block it. But the other thing is there's no material supply chain for this. There's a great um, report by Simon Michaud, he did the work for the Finnish uh, Geological Society, I think. And um, there's an, a good video online with him explaining. Uh, but Robert Lyman also did a short summary for us on our website called The Pursuit of the Impossible. And really, it would take decades, sometimes hundreds or thousands of years to mine sufficient minerals, critical minerals, for all these fancy utopian green plants. We're talking hundreds of years, billions, quadrillions of dollars. It's not going to happen. So, you know, we're really being led astray. I don't know if it's malfeasance, misfeasance, or just plain stupidity, but we're going down a path of deep, deep destruction. Well, I wonder, do you think maybe at any point some of the, the larger developing nations, the ones that really do have that increased demand, are going to start speaking up? Like the, the, the vain selfishness of doing this transition when we have developing nations that desperately need affordable, reliable energy, and they're using some very non-environmentally friendly forms of generating energy because they have to. And if we would export our clean energy to them, it would actually be better for the environment overall and, of course, better for their prosperity. They, they must see that when, when we have a prime minister who says there's no business case for exporting natural gas, bizarrely, uh, you know, and that's just to Germany. But, I mean, I'm certain India, China, a, a lot of those nations down there that are really growing in leaps and bounds would happily take on some of these uh, clean energies we could provide. Maybe they'll put some pressure on? Um, I don't know because... Um... The, you know, price, I think, is really the objective for these countries. Like people say, oh, you know, let's ship our natural gas to China and India and then we'll solve the air pollution problems there. Well, natural gas is a very complicated uh, system. LNG is very complicated compared to coal. You know, coal, you just dig it from the ground. You can dump it on the ground. <laughs> You know, you, you don't need a high pressurized system for it. I mean, obviously, there are now very good coal plants, heli plants, where they're high efficiency, low emissions, and all coal plants pretty much use pulverized coal now, so it burns very clean. Um, but in those poorer countries, coal is always going to be the first option because it's very affordable, it's abundant, you don't need, you know, very high skill, um, highly skilled people to manage most of it. Um, so price point will be a factor. But obviously, there are other mid-range countries that would certainly buy from us if we could just get it to market. So again, think of the green trade war people. Think of who out there does not want our product on the market. And think of why. And it can also be an east-west division in Canada, I'm sorry to say. But there are interests down east who are invested 
in other energy sectors overseas? Why would they want the West to compete with them? Well, absolutely. And then, of course, OPEC nations, they, they do like having a strong control over energy prices. And the way they do that is by strangling supply and they strangle their own output. But if they can, of course, even better for them, if they can slow the output in other nations, it's all the all the more profit for them as, as they keep the oil prices and, and gas prices artificially high. And you have to look at their interest in that. And that uh, gets back to a part of a, where a lot of these ENGOs get funded. But I don't know if, they, if there's ever any interest in pursuing or exposing that. I mean, Alberta talked about it and we did our big report and just kind of fell by the wayside. Yeah, well, there needs to be more done with the findings of the Alberta inquiry um, because it's very obvious in Europe. And we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a blog post about this from uh, Drew Godafridi, who's a Belgian philosopher and jurist. Um, and he writes about how Russia funded the environmental groups in Europe to push Germany especially to buy gas from Russia. And so Germany has been funding the war against Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> Put it very bluntly, that's what's been happening. Um, and because Russia funded these environmental groups. And there's quite a bit of evidence that similar things have happened here in Canada. So um, I don't have the specific details of that, but there are some reports out there. So again, you know, it's a green trade war against Alberta. And yeah. the, the sooner we take off the blinkers, you know, and stop talking about climate change, the Paris Agreement is not a legally binding document. Robert Lyman has many articles on this. And, um, you know, we shouldn't play ball because we're only 1.6% of the world's emissions in Canada, all of Canada. And even the parliamentary budget officer recently <clears throat> issued a report showing that there would be no change in global climate change, even if we met our targets. And even if we did nothing, there would be no damage to our economy. That's always the reason they say, oh, well, down the road, you know, climate change is gonna disastrously affect the, the, the economy. This is not true. Uh, it would be better if we were spending all these billions of dollars on preparing and adapting, you know, upgrading the dike system out in the Fraser Valley, um, you know, preparing Calgary for the next potential flood because there probably will be one. Um, these are all things that we can do with this money that are real adaptative things that will help people and give people real jobs rather than all this make-believe unicorn utopia. Yeah, well, in the just transition, whatever it might turn out to be, I, I mean, Trudeau has stated that that's going to be the priority of 2023, starting off the year, and he's, he's certainly taking quite an aggressive stance with Alberta already. So I got a feeling we're going to be hearing a heck of a lot more about it as to whatever it might develop into. So I appreciate your, your speaking up and helping to define that and, and keeping with it. Uh, before I let you go, so uh, where can people find more information about uh, Friends of Science and the work you guys do? Uh, well, we're on YouTube. Uh, we have a very funny little video about climate injustice for all, which is our report that we did about the just transition. And it features me sitting in the middle of a field in a chair and, and that's how the uh, just transition looks like it'll go. A chair in the middle of a field pretending to be a house. Um, we're also at uh, friendsofscience.org, our website. We're on Twitter, uh, Friends O Science on Twitter and Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. So we hope that people will engage with us. And it is our 20th year of operation. We have been asking people if they would just donate $20. Or if you like, maybe take out a membership. You can do that on our website. And um, we're going to have a live event this year. So that's in the works. It's probably going to be sometime in May. So I hope people will be able to attend for our buffet dinner and two speakers. Great. Well, we'll be watching for that. Well, thanks again for, for coming on to join us today, Michelle. It's always good to have a talk with you and just get a nice dose of some good common sense. And I really appreciate the work that uh, you guys do out there. So uh, keep at it. And, and I'm, I'm certain we'll talk again sometime soon. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Have a great trip. Great. Thank All you. Very much. The current Lethbridge feed grain prices are as follows. Cash barley's at 437, feed wheat's at 442, and corn's holy at 440 per metric ton. In the milling wheat markets, March Minneapolis futures gained 10 and a quarter cents at 9.09, with local hard red spring bids for February movement at 11.55 per bushel. In the oil seeds, nearby canola futures increased $8 at 
at 939.80 per ton, with delivered values for February movement at 18.82 per bushel. In the pulse markets, nearby red lentils remain at 33 cents a pound, and yellow peas are trading at 13.50 per bushel. In the cattle markets, February live cattle are down 52 cents at 157.22 per 100 weight. For more information on grain marketing, call me at 403-394-1711. I'm Sean Smith of Marketplace Commodities, accurate real-time marketing information and pricing options. Canadian Shooting Sports Association, without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada and more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. To become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. You can become a Western Standard member for just $10 a month or $99 a year for unlimited access.